Okay guys, uh, so welcome back. Kieran again here from the Dublin Academy of Education, uh, focusing on Never Let Me Go by Kazuo Ishiguro. So uh, continuing on from the last lesson, I want to talk about chapters 18 and 19 today. Focus again on the noteworthy events in this, these chapters and the potential significance of these events. Again, just, you know, taking this as it comes, registering these events, uh, you know, embracing the story a little bit and, and kind of focusing a little bit on our feelings at the particular time or what we think might be significant. Again, this is not an exhaustive list and this is not a reflective list in the sense that we'll put this all together later as key moments. This is just about sort of engaging with the narrative as we move along. What jumps out at you? What do you think is noteworthy? So I'll just point out a few of the things here worth considering and kind of why they might be significant. Um, first thing to mention, I suppose, uh, you know, is the fact that we're into a, a part three of the novel, so into a new phase of Cathy's life, fa you know, the final phase, century, so as I mentioned. And the other lesson, we had our, our Hailsham phase, the cottages phase, and now life as a carer. And uh, so in a sense, there's a slightly new context emerging here. So potentially we can use this when we're talking about cultural context. Um, something that's significant about that really, and the Cathy flags right, right, right away on page 203, is the loneliness. Um, second paragraph on page 203, when she's just describing a little bit about her life to whoever she's addressing this memoir to, then there's the solitude. You grow up surrounded by crowds of people. That's all you've ever known. And suddenly you're a carer. You spent hour after hour on your own, driving across the country, centre to centre, hospital to hospital, sleeping in overnights, no one to talk to about your worries, no one to laugh with. Just now and again, you run into a student you know, a carer or donor you recognise from the old days, but there's never much time. And so on. So just to flag that, that the solitude, the loneliness that sort of defines this new context, and then she recalls this memory, uh, and this is certainly something that we can flag here, meeting Laura as, as another sort of noteworthy or significant event. So, meeting Laura, and really what we notice here uh, in this, uh, this other character is the change. How different she is from the person that Cathy remembers, because of course, this is the life, and this is the point really of the novel is, the toll that this takes and the descriptions of Laura here and the way that she um, interacts with Cathy and the way that, um, you know, that, that she kind of, just the toll that everything seems to be taking on her. The strong impression that's emerging is this is not an easy life. Um, and they talk a little bit about Ruth. And what we see here then is that the, uh, the, the, the reality, again, of their, these clones' lives starting to emerge. I, I'm saying clones, but really I should be saying these, these people, these students' lives. As, as donors, we're, we're hearing, and, and Cathy's receiving this information, that this is on page 206 uh, in a second and way, but the idea of a bad first donation. The idea, um, you know, and, 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 and Cathy flies it right in the middle of page 206. Poor Ruth. She says this, so she's, she's heard, they've both heard that Ruth had a bad first issue. We don't really know what that means. It's a little bit sinister, but again, it's something uh, that we do notice here. So again, it's just maybe another thing worth flagging. Roots, bad first donation. Because again, and I know that a lot of you are asking questions here about, you know, the, the mechanics, as I say, of this process. Um, the grim reality here, how does this all work? Um, you know, what happens if, you know, how can you even donate certain things and so on. And, uh, you know, we really have to kind of think about, well, which sort of, you know, organs are we talking about d donating, you know, how many of those can be donated before it's fatal uh, to a person and so on. And quite an unpleasant, I suppose, uh, thing to start thinking about. But, uh, you know, what we, the, the impression here is really that whatever Ruth was called up for, whatever she began to donate, clearly took its toll on her. So this is the reality. So as much as these clones have sort of been indoctrinated into this way of thinking that donating is their purpose, uh, and that they simply use this sort of benign vocabulary, this kind of neutral vocabulary of carers, donors, completing, you know, rather than saying dying, um, the reality is still the same. The reality is still what it is. So something certainly worth noting in there. 
Um, just on page 207, uh, we get a little bit of information here, which is maybe also significant. And this idea is I'm just going to move over. Uh, actually, I'll just erase it off this board here. Uh, this idea as well of Hailsham closing. That is a, another piece of information that we get here, all based on this, uh, this meeting. Hailsham is no more, so Hailsham closing. The fact that it's, um, the captain receives this information. So we talked a little bit more, so this is at the top of page 207. Uh, sorry, uh, halfway down, page 207. It was that exchange when we finally mentioned the closing of Hailsham that suddenly brought us close again and we hugged quite spontaneously, not so much to comfort one another, but as a way of affirming Hailsham. The fact that it was still there in both our memories, that I had then I had to hurry off to my own car. I'd first started hearing rumours about Hailsham closing a year or so before that meeting with Laura in the car park. I'd been talking to a donor or a carer and they'd bring it up in passing, like they expected me to know all about it. You were, you were at Hailsham, weren't you? So is it really true? That sort of thing. Then one day I was coming out of the clinic in Suffolk and ran into Roger C, who'd been in the year below, and he told me with complete certainty it was about to happen. Hailsham was going to close any day and there were plans to sell the house and grounds to a hotel chain. I remember my first response when he told me this. I said, but what will happen to all the students? Roger obviously thought I'd meant the ones still there, the little ones dependent on their guardians. And he put on a troubled face and began speculating how they'd have to be transferred to other houses around the country, even though some of these would be a far cry from Hailsham. And that expression of far cry, very different. But of course, that wasn't what I meant. I meant us. All the students we, who'd grown up with me and were now spread across the country, carers and donors, all separated now, but still somehow linked by the place we've come from. So again, what we see here is like this significance, and even in this news of Hailsham closing, it becomes much more than a school, and it's becoming, it is this symbol. So again, the importance, the centrality of Hailsham as a place way more than a school and you know more even than, than an institution but the centrality of it to all of these lives but particularly as opposed to Kathy the centrality of it to Kathy's life the idea that it is something fundamental something that she kind of defines herself by and a link between her and all of these other students certainly very significant in terms of how she thinks about that so um, I like the way that she actually uses the metaphor and I think that this is again very, very noteworthy. On the bottom of page, well, actually, I'm going to continue to read because there's a kind of a flow to this, but the way she connects Hailsham to the, the image of the clown and the balloons, and as well, it's noteworthy for a couple of reasons. So as she kind of reflects on that, um, which again is, is an expansion of that moment. So Hailsham closing and Kathy's um, reflection on that. So thinking really about that significance, thinking about that centrality uh, and that central role that it plays in her life well how does she kind of imagine this and she she picks this image of the clown and, the, and kind of equates it to this in some way to these balloons so just continue on there for page 208 that same night trying to get to sleep in an overnight uh, in an overnight i kept thinking about something that had happened to me a few days earlier I'd been in a seaside town in North Wales. It had been raining hard all morning, but after lunch, it had stopped and the sun had come out of it. I was walking back to where I'd left my car along one of those long, straight seafront roads. There was hardly anyone else about, so I could see an unbroken line of wet paving stones stretching out in front of me. Then after a while, a van pulled up, maybe 30 yards ahead of me, and a man got out dressed as a clown. He opened the back of the van and took out a bunch of helium balloons, about a dozen of them, and for a moment, he was holding the balloons in one hand while he bent down and rummaged about in his vehicle with the other. As I came closer, I could see the balloons had faces and shaped ears, and they looked like a little tribe, bobbing in the air above their owner, waiting for him. And again, maybe even just note that, that the likening of them to a little tribe. Again, she's thinking of herself and the Hailship students. Then the clown straightened closed up his van and started walking in the same direction I was walking, several paces ahead of me, a small suitcase in one hand, the balloons in the other. The seafront continued long and straight, 
and I was walking behind him for what seemed like ages. Sometimes I felt awkward about it, and I, and I even thought that the clown might turn and say something. But since that was the way I had to go, there wasn't much else I could do. So we just kept walking, the clown and me, on and on along the deserted pavement, still wet from the morning. And all the time the balloons were bumping and grinning down at me. Every so often, I could see the man's fist where all the balloon strings converged, and I got into coming together. And I could see he had them securely twisted together in a tight grip. Even so, I kept worrying that one of the strings would come unraveled and a single balloon would sail off up into that cloud. Lying awake that night, after what Roger told me, I kept seeing those balloons again. I thought about Hailsham closing and how it was like someone coming along with a pair of shears and snipping the balloon strings just where they entwined above the man's face. Once that happened, there'd be no real sense in which those balloons belonged with each other anymore. When he was telling me the news about Hailsham, Roger made a remark saying he supposed it wouldn't make so much difference to the likes of us anymore. And in certain ways, he might have been right. But it was unnerving to think things weren't still going on back there, just as always, that people like Miss Geraldine say weren't leading groups of juniors around the North playing field. In the months after that talk with Roger, I kept thinking about it a lot about Hailsham closing and all the implications. And it started to dawn on me, maybe highlight these lines, it started to dawn on me, I suppose, that a lot of things I'd always assumed I'd plenty of time to get round to doing, I might not now, I might now have to act on pretty soon or else let them go forever. So again, this is the reality. This is the reality of, in a sense, all our lives. But again, it's the the realization by Cathy that time is limited and the time is running out and this is the kind of thing that pushes her into that realization again a very human realization that we're not going to live forever but obviously in her case much more of an imminent I suppose um, end so it's not that I started to panic exactly but it definitely felt like Hailsham's going away had shifted everything around us so again a couple of things were mentioned there. Cathy's reflection, again, why is it significant? Again, the, the idea of running out of time um, is, is certainly something uh, that we know, again, the, the human experience um, and that realization. And also the, the uh, creative and memorable image, uh, and again, this creativity of, uh, of the balloons. And the way that Cathy kind of constructs that, the way that she sort of connects those ideas in this very kind of poetic way. And that is worth noting as well, because again, remember, kind of underlying all of this at all times is like, are these students, do these students behave like humans? Do they, are they human? Are their relationships recognizably human? Are their responses recognizably human and so on? And it's events like this where we see that creativity come in in maybe a slightly more organic way that it is definitely the strong evidence here of their humanity. So, um, Following on from that, and obviously this is the kind of the springboard, uh, Kathy seeks out Ruth. So that too is another sort of a, a key um, event worth, worth noting here again, because of this idea of, of, of connection to the past, this idea of nostalgia, uh, and this idea that Kathy, you know, really, and, and, you know, does decide uh, to go and find Ruth and try and reconnect with her past, and, and what sort of, you know, gets that, that um, event and, and motivates that. So, uh, why is it significant? Well, it's again this natural human desire, I suppose, that we all have. And I mentioned this to you early on in this um, in this novel about how really the, these students have this strange kind of sibling bond. Um, you know, despite the fact that they obviously end up in romantic relationships with one another, and um, so it's it's a curious kind of a bond. But there is this sense of of um, you know a sisterly rivalry almost between Ruth and Kathy. What we see here is this you know, this desire to connect with the past. Again, we've seen this already. This, this is reinforcing the idea of the possibles as well. This, uh, this theme of identity, wanting to know where we came from and then connecting back with that past, the people from our past, the people we remember, the people, Kathy, you know, the, the connection she feels with Ruth. And even though they parted on somewhat problematic terms, the fact that she wants to, you know, reinitiate that or reestablish that connection and that, that relationship, so, so significant. And that's followed along then with reuniting with Tommy. And it's kind of the same idea. So, you know, 
the three of them back together again. So once she's kind of reconnected with Ruth, and then how they, they go to Kingsfield to make uh, to, to to contact Tommy again and uh, to make, to reestablish that connection. It's all about really the past, about their shared experiences at Hailsham, how they want to reconnect with those things. And then we get to this other significant moment really uh, in this in this chapter. So we're looking here at page 218. So we're skimming forward uh, just a little bit of a chunk there, just over some of the uh, the recollections of actually reconnecting with those characters. Um, it's really about the boat. And this, this visit to this boat is a sort of a, a strange kind of an event, I suppose, in many respects. And I'm sure some of you are reading it going, are they going to this old boat or what significance does this have or whatever? Well, really, the significance of the boat uh, is, is a, a, as, as a symbol, essentially. So what we do is we just record the event, you know, visiting this, uh, this idea of this stranded boat. Um, and what that might represent, now first of all, it's, it's obviously just a sort of a, a little adventure, a little journey these characters undertake, again, as, as people do, I suppose, when they're passing the time and, and so on. A couple of things about this which are noteworthy. Firstly, on the way to the boat, and I'd like you to just, on the top, at the, about a third of the way down, page 218, um, focusing on Ruth and the exertion and the toll it was taking on her. So. Um, the, the reality of donations again being reinforced, this, uh, this, uh, this observation that Ruth is struggling. Um, and again, remember, she is a young woman. She's probably only um, in her early to the 20s at this point. We entered the woods, and though it was pretty easy walking, I noticed Ruth's breath coming less and less easily. Tommy, by contrast, didn't seem to be experiencing any difficulty though there was a hint of a limp in his gait. That means his walk, his, uh, the way he carried himself. Then we came to a barbed wire fence which was tilted and rusted. The wire itself yanked all over the place. When Ruth saw it, she came to an abrupt halt. Oh no, she said anxiously. Then she turned to me. You didn't say anything about this. You didn't say we had to get past barbed wire. It's not going to be difficult, I said. We can go under it. We just have to hold it for each other. But Ruth looked really upset and didn't move. Now, again, it's a small moment, but it's really reinforcing, like a young woman in this scenario, like feeling this out of breath on just a walk, a fairly, um, you know, a walk which carried not by any particular exertion, exertion. She should not be suffering in this way. This is the grim reality of, of these donations. And there's nothing, you know, kind of romantic or noble or anything else about it. It takes its toll on these characters just as it would anybody else. So again, just a small moment worth, worth noting. The other, I suppose, most significant thing maybe about this boat is as a symbol. It is symbolic because something that the characters uh, zero in on and discuss uh, a little bit, or Tommy at least wonders aloud, is where did this come from? Uh, how did it get here? So if we look at, again, page 218, um, it's, uh, sorry, not 218, uh, it's 220. Sorry, if you just turn the page there, just about, about a third away from the bottom, highlight the line, I wonder how it got here. Actually, it's Kathy, sorry, says that, my mistake, not Tommy. I said, I'd raised my voice to let it get to the others who had expected an echo, but the sound was surprisingly close, like I was in a carpeted room. And then I heard Tommy say behind me, maybe this is what Hailsham looks like now, do you think? So the, the, the symbolic significance here of the boat really is the idea that the boat is stranded. The boat is a curiosity and it really shouldn't be where it is. And it doesn't have any business here inland. It is stranded. It is out of place. And it just raises questions about how it got there. And there's a clear connection being forged here between the boat and these clones. Because remember, they are, uh, for all intents and purposes, they are artificial people. They have been, uh, you know, genetically engineered to some extent in, in that they are cloned. Um, and really, there's an idea maybe that they are somewhat out of place and that they too, maybe like the boat, are somewhat stranded and kind of lost and in the wrong place and really don't belong here. So it's a, it's a very powerful symbol and a, and a good key moment. It's also some of the conversations that happen here um, that are, are really significant and also, you know, particularly most noteworthy, Ruth 
um, and, and her discussion then with Kathy and Tommy on page 228, I want to get back to the sentence, how she wants them to be together. So if I could just ask you again to skip forward here. So Ruth's wish is kind of uh, almost like a, not quite a, a dying wish, of, but of sorts. Um, page 228, third of the way down, she laughed and said, because nothing. I'd like you to forgive me, but I don't expect you to. Anyway, that's not the half of it. Not even a small bit of it, actually. And highlight this line. The main thing is I kept you and Tommy apart. Her voice had dropped again, almost to a whisper. That was the worst thing I did. So again, this reflective element of Ruth, <clears throat> and admitting maybe that she in some ways stood between these characters, the relationship there, the kind of resolution maybe of the love triangle and so on and I suppose really the selflessness of, 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 of her final act because again thinking about what makes this human maybe thinking about elements of the general vision viewpoint certainly thinking about themes of identity and the kinds of people that we want to be and how we define ourselves what we see here with Ruth is on page 231 particularly so she admits there at the, the um, the, the, you know, the, the, the reality that she kind of st stood between Kathy and Tommy, which we kind of maybe felt even as readers all along. And then on page 231, I'm just going to read through this and then we'll, we'll call it because that's um, just kind of the, the end of, of our, our, our chapter 19. The poignancy here and the sadness, but never fully articulated um, about, you know, when Ruth. So in a sense, it, it is sort of a, a type of, of dying wish, really. Um, so let's just have a look at it. That was three days after her second donation, when they finally let me in to see her in the small hours of the morning. She was in a room by herself, and it looked like they'd done everything they could for her. It had become obvious to me by then, from the way the doctors, the coordinator, the nurses were behaving, that they didn't think she was going to make it. Now I took, on, took one glance at her in that hospital bed under the dull light and recognized the look of her, on her face, which I'd seen on donors often enough before, it was like she was willing her eyes to see right inside herself so she could patrol and marshal all the better the separate areas of pain in her body. The way maybe an anxious carer might rush between three or four ailing donors in different parts of the country. She was, strictly speaking, still conscious, but she wasn't accessible to me as I stood there beside her metal bed. All the same, I pulled up a chair and sat with her, hand in both of mine, squeezing whenever another flood of pain made her twist away from me. I stood beside her like that for as long as they would let me, three hours, maybe longer. And as I say, for almost all of that time, she was far away inside herself. But just once, as she was twisting herself in a way that seemed scarily unnatural, and I was on the verge of calling the nurses for more painkillers, just for a few seconds, no more, she looked straight at me and she knew exactly who I was. It was one of those little islands of lucidity. Lucidity means clarity or being, making things clear.